let's go to God's word together and then we will uh, look to him uh, for his word. Uh, let's uh, read Daniel chapter 10 verses 1 through 6 together in unison. And then and I'm going to cover uh, chapter 10 through 12 in a kind of a uh, broad way today. Uh, let's read God's word for us today. Daniel chapter 10 and let's read together in ESV version. Uh, this is God's word for us today. Let's read. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a word was revealed to Daniel who was named Belshazzar. And the word was true and it was a great conflict. Okay, I will continue to read. And then he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacies, no meat or wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, and that is Tigris, I lifted up my eyes and looked, and behold, a man clothed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphrates around his waist. His body was like burial, and then his face like the appearance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words like the sound of multitude. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that you are a good God, that you love us. And then you have sent Jesus Christ to die for us and sent to us as a missionary. But you also invite us to go with the good news of Jesus Christ to others so that others may come to know about you. Lord, we thank you for the good testimony. and We pray that you will continue to strengthen those that have gone so that their trip will not just end, that it will be a life that will be continued to be used of you as they share about you, not just during the mission trip, but uh, throughout their lives. Lord, we look to you for your word. We pray that you will speak to us what you have placed on my heart as I share and deliver. And may you use it to whisper to us uh, what you want to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Some of you might know a name, Harold Camping. And then he was a radio Bible teacher. He was a president of a family radio in the States, especially when I was attending uh, seminary you know, back sometime. And then he was a president of a family radio, which was a Christian broadcasting. And then he had something close to 150 translator slash stations, um, places through which that he was broadcasting. Uh, through his network broadcasting, and then I was hearing Chuck Swindoll, Charles Stanley, James Dobson, and many others. And in fact, while I was living in Philadelphia, and in two stations, you know, the, was a, a, a broadcasting. Uh, uh, the things from uh, Family Bible, and then I had uh, one of them on at all time. Uh, he was an interesting uh, Bible teacher, but. As he was going on, one of the things that he began to get into was a study of prophecy. And then close to, uh, as he, he was uh, doing that more, he began to uh, predict, make a prediction of when Jesus would come and then when the final days would be. Uh, he predicted that Jesus would return on May 21st, 2011, whereupon the saved world will be taken up into heaven in rapture, and there will follow five months of fire, brimstone, and plagues on earth, with millions of people dying each day, culminating on October 21st, 2011, with the final destruction of the world. You see, he had 150 Christian radio broadcasting stations and then he was using all those to really push for this campaign. There were a lot of people swayed and that participated. The time came and Jesus did not come and then only after he realized that it just did not work 
and then he had to confess that he acknowledged the predicting a day was sinful and then he uh, uh, so acknowledge also, emphasizing the words of Matthew uh, 24, that he was not to go beyond what the Bible has said. Well, a lot of people thought that was a foolish of him. And then a lot of Christian people thought, hey, you're going beyond what the scripture says. But he was trying to wrestle with what the scripture was teaching about the end times. That how we are to live expecting Jesus' imminent coming. I'm not saying that oh, all he did was right. But on the other side, sometimes when we live our Christian life, we just focus so much on what happens day to day. And then we lose the big picture. That yes, indeed. The days are numbered and Jesus is coming. That we need to live with eternity in view. As we look around, we see many signs of the time that his days are coming near. As we see many challenges, especially the Christians face. When we, who profess the exclusive faith that Jesus is the only way and Christianity and what Jesus has done on the cross is the only way that people can come to know God and people are now resisting more and people are now becoming more persecuted and there are other challenges that people raise when we speak about the marriage and sanctity of marriage how the scripture defines it and then people said that is illegal and raised many questions. In the midst of challenging situations like this, how are we to live as God's people? You see, the section that we are reading is a second half of Daniel. Chapter 1 through 6 was of a biographical, the incident and record of how he lived, but from chapter 7, prophetic picture about what is to come and then today's section chapters 10 through 12 and speaks about the last vision and that was given to Daniel and as we look at it it's going to talk about many things that are confusing and it's going to uh, be a difficult thing to work through but as we're working through what the Bible is saying what God is saying about how the end will come what's very important is that we should also have an attitude that Daniel had looking to the future and how we are to be and last Sunday I mentioned in conclusion, that we are to be wise. We need to be wise, knowing the signs, but how we are to live as God's people. Daniel chapter 10 to 12 can be divided into three sections. Chapter 10, Daniel praying and then being visited by a heavenly visitor. Chapter 11, the long descriptive prophecy about what is to come. And chapter 12, concluding part about the prophecy. But as we're looking at this prophecy, I want you to think together with me how we also need to be like Daniel, wise person, responding and living in light of the end time and then what is to come. I want to share together with three things. One is this, as a wise person, that you and I will have a heart that Daniel had, bearing God's burdens. Second, as a wise person, you and I will gain a perspective that God gives to Daniel. As a wise person, that you and I will live as God sent people working together for him and his kingdom. Let's think about the first wise person having a wise heart the bearing God's burden the verse 1 starts out like this in the third year of Cyrus king of Persia a word was revealed to Daniel which was named Belshazzar the word was true and it was about a great conflict 
And he understood the word and had understanding of the vision. And then verse 2, In those days I, Daniel, was mourning for three weeks. I ate no delicacy, no meat. Wine entered my mouth, nor did I anoint myself at all for the full three weeks. On the 24th day of the first month, I was standing at the bank of great river. I lift up my eyes and looked and behold. And then the heavenly visitor came. Here. This is what we see. Daniel described this is a third year, and then he was uh, uh, celebrating, uh, especially in the month when there's a new year, the calendar year that begins together with the Passover. And then he celebrated the Passover, and then the week long on 11. Uh, bread, uh, the festival, and then it was a time when people were eating and feasting of God's goodness and then worshiping. But here, he was over there mourning. And he was mourning, and then he could not eat anything. What's going on here? What's going on here? One thing that we could see here is this. In his revelation, he was told of great conflict. And yes, God's people are going to go through many difficult challenges. And as he is thinking about those things, and he was praying, and then he just could not be at rest and peace. And that's one thing. But another thing is that it was a third year of Cyrus the king. Do you know what happened on the first year of Cyrus the king? The 70 years of captivity finally came to an end. In the first year of King Cyrus, and the edict was given that Jewish people, God's people, are now able to go back and rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple, rebuild the wall. But what happened was this. Yes, for 70 years, so many people near the river, they were singing songs of Zion and praying and waiting for the day that there I am to go back and then build that city again. But when the time and opportunity came, only few people, so little people, went back because so many others settled down and became comfortable there. But what was more, when they went in, the work that God says, yes, this is a new work that I am doing, new opportunity, new chapter, as they were seeking to build God's work and build the temple and then the wall. It became so difficult and it was not easy. The work of God was not going so well and there was an opposition. Samaritans came and opposed and then in fact what happened was they resisted and then they wrote letter to the king and then while the king Cyrus was out on the military campaign, while his son was in charge and then the letter requesting him to take a look at it and then his son made another edict stopping Israel people, God's people building the wall and rebuilding Jerusalem. That's what happened. Daniel has been praying for so long that God will preserve and then God will open door and then God will open new chapter, new work. And so little people went back. And the work was so hard and then opposition was so severe and now the edict was given that they cannot do it anymore. In the midst of it, as he was celebrating Passover, as he was celebrating festival, he just couldn't eat and he was mourning. God, why is it, why is it that only so few people went back? Why is it that serving you and doing what you are inviting us to do so hard. Why is the opposition so fierce? Why so many walls blocking? God, what's going on? God, what do we do? 
and he couldn't but continue to pour his tears and mourn before the Lord. And that's what we see. He was mourning and praying as he was in tears and God sends a special person and then bringing the message, encouraging him that God has heard his prayer and then God is strengthening him to continue to pray and then God through his prayer is beginning to do something even more and that's what we see here. You know, in the, the, the mission trip, some of the people came and then shared together with me things like this. Pastor Cha, you know, as I'm spending time together with these people, you know, my heart is aching. My heart really hurt to see the situation in which that they are in. And, or God has given me a new burden. I realize that I need to pray for these people. And then I need to just to intercede on behalf of these people. And then it was exciting to hear and then see them engage, catching what God is laying on their hearts to burden so that they will continue to be in prayer for others. You know, seminary professor Sinclair Ferguson speaks about what happened when his uh, pastor of uh, his home church talked about what happened when he, not him, but his pastor came to this church in Scotland. And then when he came to this church, a lady called and then wanted to see him and said, I've been praying for some time for God to send a not-so-ordinary pastor to do a special work for God in this city. I heard that you are that unusual person. I was a Bible study teacher and had more than 100 ladies meeting for the Bible study weekly, but I were not able to do that, especially when my husband passed away. But God placed the burden on me, and God told me to pray. Pray. Pray for a new work that God is going to do. That God will send somebody. That God will begin to raise up people from here. So I've been praying, praying, praying. And I was wondering who God is going to send. I heard you are the person. Sinclair Ferguson said, Our church was not a mega church, but it was a church where the Bible was taught so many of young people growing up got to know and love, had a big kingdom vision, and many of us have become missionaries, pastors, and others, tracing back to how God burdened and invited this woman to pray together for the work of God. Did you know that war vision and compassion was both started in Korea after the Korean War? And uh, the, the, the thing, the phrase that Bob Pierce, the founder of war vision, often used to speak as he was reporting the dire situation, the need of a, a Korean children and orphan was this. Let my heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. As he was exposed to the need, he realized that God was inviting him, that this is what's on my heart as I see these people. Pray and do what you can, so that through your prayer and through your obedience, that God was going to bring about a change, and God was going to bring about his work. I hope and pray that you and I will have a heart like Daniel. The heart that is not so small, so focused on me, my happiness, my job, my family, my kids, my kids' career, and what's going to happen to my friend. But that God will stretch our hearts so that we will learn to 
not only love God, love people that God loves, places on your heart, in your lives, so that you will pray, intercede, and mourn for them. A.W. told you, the Bible is written in tears. Moses praying in tears, and God have mercy. I put my life on the line for these. Paul also praying, God have mercy on my people that are rejecting you. And God have mercy. I want to put my life on the line for them. It was not the eloquence and the ability and many others. God many times works through those prayers, through those tears, through those burdens. And God brings about his work as we continue to intercede before God. You know, if you, while you're driving, walking, bring God, puts a thought about me or church, uh, take that as God's invitation and pray. Don't just say, oh, I wonder what happened. But then please do pray. And then help us. And then continue to be a part and then be a person that's wise, that has a heart. Uh, second, I want to focus on the next chapter, and then chapter 11 starts out with a long list of things. But I want to focus on you, your perspective, and then your head, what you see as you see the history. You know, I have a, a nearsightedness. Uh, up until recently, I had a surgery, and then I had a thick glasses, and I could only see very uh, close to, you know, the, uh, what I'm seeing. And when I'm driving, I just try to concentrate so I do not miss too much. Uh, but then my wife, Jamie, has a good eyesight, and then she is able to see uh, very far, but not just very far, but, but she has a good peripheral eyesight. So whenever we uh, go into e-mart or a place to park, I'm just trying to drive and see. I'm not hitting any car, but, but you know, the, uh, she glances and says, oh, there are two spots that's available. Make a right, and then I saw a spot. And then it's a, uh, it's a wonder to me. I'm like, how can you see all that? And then she turns to me and says, how can you not see? It's over there. Well, you know, uh, with my two children, sometimes uh, what we played is uh, as we were driving in the car, the punch buggy. And basically what it is, uh, if you see a uh, Volkswagen a bug or beetle, and then the first person that sees it punches the other person's uh, arm or punch buggy. But the thing is, you know, what happens is, is as we're driving, many times we just don't see, I mean, not the punch buggies, but bugs that often. But when my kids are in and then as we're driving, they spot, you know, the bugs and beetles so often. And then they end up hitting my shoulder many times. You know, that's what happens many times. As we are just uh, trying to look out and see, hey, what's happening here? And uh, if you know what you're looking for, and then what you're looking at, and then you're able to find them and see them so much better. You see, that's how it is as we're looking toward the prophecy and what is to come. And then as we are looking at God and looking for God and what he's doing and what he's unfolding and God's purpose and action, as we have our eyes fixed on God, and then we will be able to see the patterns that will help us to understand better. Chapter 11 is a difficult passage to understand. I'm not going to go in much detail trying to explain everything. What is this? But in the long description, here we see what God is doing and what God has been revealing about who He is in the first six chapters of what has happened. Same themes we see as we're looking into 
the prophecy of what is to come. You know, biography, and how is that different than prophecy? Biography or history is it's a record of something that has happened. And prophecy, especially predictive prophecy, is about what is not yet happened. But chapter 11 of Daniel reads almost like a record of biography. Listen to this verse. Verse 3. And then, then a mighty king shall rise, and then who shall rule with great dominion and do as he will. And as soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken, divided toward the four winds of the heaven, but not to his posterity, not according to the authority with which he rule. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Here. It's recording about Alexander the Great and how he comes up as a strong king and then overtakes the, the kings of Persia and then beginning a new Greek empire. But he was a, such a powerful person. And but because even what he wanted to do and then uh, doesn't every father want to share his inheritance together with his children his untimely death and then he was not able to give what he has accomplished to his two children who was assassinated but he was divided into four as we see this we almost see this like hey is this written afterward and what we see here is this that God is God of history God who raised Nebuchadnezzar and then he brought down other kings now he's able to do that and then he's able to show you that he really is indeed sovereign over what is to come not just 10 years down the line even further. You see, when Nebuchadnezzar came to Daniel and said, tell me the dream that I'm not going to tell you. God who revealed about the dream that nobody was telling and the interpretation. When Nebuchadnezzar said, which God is able to protect you from fiery furnace? God who came near protected. Which God is able to protect you from the mouths of the lion? God who did. God who came and became a baby. God who came and gave and died in our place and rose from the dead. God who one day will come back and will judge. You see, it's not about, oh, can God predict? No. Much, much bigger than that. Our God is God who is sovereign and God is God of history. The section that follows speaks about king of the south and king of the north and it goes on for a long time. Who is this? But what's important is what is this south of and north of? It's south of Israel. North of Israel center of God unfolding history. At the center is God pursuing his people and God building his church and then God building his people and that's what we see. So marriage alliance and how one kingdom attacks the others and the story goes on and then you could read more about this along with history of Syrian and then Egyptian war and how some of those things are described clearly in a predictive, prophetic way here. It goes even further as it speaks about the coming of Antichrist and how through his coming there will be a, a difficult time that God's people will encounter. And then how there will be a person and then focusing on blaspheming God and then will have a difficult time and then God's people will go through many, many challenging times and then through all those things and then one day when 
Jesus comes, how God will bring. Jesus will bring everything to an end in a, with his breath, with a, a brightness of his presence. And then we see that happening here. Let me try to present it like this. Our God is God of history. God is the one that is sovereign. But the themes that we saw in the biographical section, chapter 1 through 6, we see it all together. Yes, God is at work. Yes, yes, fear is real as we hear about difficulty coming. But God's sovereignty even more real. Yes, God who is together with God's people, He will continue to be there. And then God who is at work, causing all things to work together for good, and He will be there. Yes, the fruit of righteousness. Wickedness will lead to more wickedness. Righteousness leading to more righteousness. But all these things coming to a climax when Jesus will come and bring everything to an end. You know, when people sometimes ask, hey, what's the meaning of the book of Revelation with all those symbolism and with all these difficult things? And, and there could be a lot of different ways to understand that the main message of the book of Revelation is that God wins. God's going to bring everything to an end. And that's the message that we see. That yes, surprising thing that I saw again in chapter 12 verse 7. You know, when is this going to be at end? After a time, times and a half a time. And then verse 7 it says this. You know, but then when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all things will be finished. It's not when Jesus comes, shatters the power of evil. No, when the power of God's people will be shattered, that's when Jesus will come and then bring everything to judgment. Chapter 12 verses 2 records like this. Here it says, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Here, in the book of Daniel, it speaks about Jesus coming. It speaks about resurrection. And that's how Everything will come to an end. We heard testimony today. Testimony of uh, how God proved himself to be faithful. As we look back, we could give testimony of how God was true and answered our prayer and then came through. But we just do not say, hey, things went better. And then I'm so glad that I don't have the problem anymore. No, it's not just those. As we testify, we testify about it, the God that came and intervened and met and proved himself faithful. In the midst of our needs and situations, God came through. And God who showed himself faithful. And then as we look forward, he who is faithful will continue to be together with us and will show himself, prove himself to be faithful together with us. You see, biblical perspective. We look back and see God's hand, but we also look forward and see God's promise and God who is at work. And then we see today, Knowing today, God is at work with you and together with you, building eternity in the midst of where he has placed you. I talked about two things. To be wise. Not just that we will live for ourselves, but that we may have the heart that God burdened Daniel to have. 
that we will have God's burden so that we may be people that are willing to get involved and serve and pray and stand with the people of God and work of God so that we will be used of God to further and strengthen God and God's work. Also to see in the midst of confusing things, chaotic things, the things that we do not understand, that we will see God who is God of history. God who is unfolding his purpose. God who is building his church. And then God who is at work. One more. Wise person and his hand. How you are to live in the midst of the last day. Verse 3 is what I want to read together again. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. Those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. When Billy Graham was asked many years ago, you are the person that God has used to share the gospel to most people. If you were to go back and then do it all over again, how would you do it? And then he said, I would spend less time preaching. I would spend more time studying the word and praying and preparing to do the work of the ministry. You know, Chapter 11, verse 32, records about another description of wise person. People who know their God shall stand firm and they are able to be the wise that will help many to understand. What I want to talk to you and encourage you is this. For you to be like the star that shines. For you to be the people that God has called you to be. One thing that you need to be first is that you and I need to be people that come to know God and love God deeply. You know, unless you and I come to know God and know what kind of a, a person He is, and God's character, and then who He is and what He does, unless we are deeply committed and connected and established in Him, we cannot withstand many challenges and trials and many others. I hope you and I will become men and women of God's Word so that we will come to know God better. But here, I said, here and Daniel is now becoming like a star that shines. And this is what I mean. From a distance and inspiring many and pointing many to come to know Jesus. But before that happens, Daniel was living as a salt and a light before he became the star. You and I are called upon to live as a salt where God has placed you and me to be. Salt that cleanses, purifies, preserves, and adds flavor in the midst of difficulty, broken, and smelly place. And God is sending you where he has sent you to be the salt. And so that you can begin to touch life with Jesus' life that is in you. And then you be the star, notice light, so that the others through your life will see. But then we see here that he, Daniel, being like a star and leading many to righteousness, stars for ever. I hope you and I will be like Daniel, like a star. But before you become a star, you need to be the light. Before you need to be the light, you and I are called upon to be the salt. Salt that lives Christ's life 
where he has placed you. When Daniel was asking, what do I do? He says, go on doing what God has called you to do and to be. That's right. Go on where God has placed you. Be God's people. Do what God has called you to do. And so that people may come to know Jesus through you and through your life. At the end of life, I hope you and I will not have too many regrets. What kind of regret do people have at the end of their lives? Some have regrets and saying, Oh, I wasted my time. I did stupid things that I shouldn't have done. I'm sure many of us you know, have that kind of things that we regret about. Why did I do that? But there are other kinds of regret. I know I should have. I could have. I know I was supposed to. But I didn't get to do it. I have never shared about Jesus. I have never fasted for somebody so that that person will come to know Jesus. I've never gone on a short-term mission. I never volunteered to be a teacher for a year. I have never, never, never. I hope that you will not have that kind of regret as you face the end of your life. I hope that you will be able to say, yeah, I don't know why I did it, but it was crazy, but God was good. Yesterday, uh, our team that went to Habitat, you know, I met them in the morning and prayed together with them, and they left, and then I took my son to a, a, a going to soup kitchen, and then he wanted to go for the first time. I took him there and dropped him off and just said hello to a few other people and then came. But then I was reminding myself again, I need to come out here more. I need to go to Habitat and other things more. Not just so that I will be a blessing to others, but for myself. I need to be out there seeing these homeless people sitting around. And I need to go to short-term missions, Sri Lanka and Mongolia and others. People living oppressed under false religion. And to see people that are living oppressed by so many bondages. You need to go. You need to go and see. You need to go and pray together and serve together with them. Not just so that God will use you to bless them, so that your heart will not shrivel up. That you will not be somebody that's so content about coming to church once a week, going to Bible study time to time, and giving money here and there, and patting your back thinking, I'm a good Christian. I do more for the Lord than many others. No. I hope that you will live your life according to the burden and the call that God has given you. Go. Get involved. Few people have stamped the collective consciousness of our country like Jonathan Edward. He was an intellectual prodigy entering Yale University at age 12. He was buried at Princeton University where he served as a president until his death, 1758. Edwards was an author of a dozen of volumes and both theologically inspirational. And then his biography of David Brainerd has inspired countless missionaries to go, uh, to go all in with God to serve him. But it was Jonathan Edward who sparked America's first great awakening with his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. But his greatest legacy may be his children, progeny, which include more than 300 ministers and missionaries, 120 university professors, 60 authors, 30 judges, and 14 college presidents, three members of Congress, one vice president. The legacy, like every spiritual genealogy, traces back to a 
defining moment. It was Jonathan Edwards' defining moment. On January 12, 1723, Jonathan Edwards made a written consecration of himself to God. He wrote it out longhand in his diary and revisited it often over the years. I made a solemn dedication of myself to God and wrote it down, giving up myself and all that I have to God to be for the future in no respect my own, to act as one that had no right to himself in any respect, and solemnly vow to take God for my whole portion, looking on nothing else as any part of my happiness, not acting as if it were. Along with his solemn consecration to God, Jonathan Edwards formulated 70 resolutions, goals, that would be foundation of his faith and practice. Resolution according to about relationships, family, work, and about himself and many others. And then he revisited them every week throughout his life. God used him greatly, but there was a time that he gave himself fully to the Lord. Resolution. Daniel chapter 1 verse 5. Daniel resolved not to defile himself. And then he gave himself to serve God fully. I hope that you and I as we conclude and think about so many things that we have learned from the story and life and example and teachings from the book of Daniel, that you and I will resolve to live like Daniel, be Daniel, where God has placed you. Let us pray. living in the end times as a wise person. I talked about three things. Wise person's heart. Your heart. I hope that it's not a shriveled up heart. Only concerned about me. My. My things. I hope that your perspective that you will see more than opportunities but that you will see God and then his hand and his action that you will also hear God saying I have put you there live your life for me be my servant would you just take time and just listen and then respond to the Lord <laughs>